All right, Jordan Barry, the laundromat king. As uh, I was trying to think of something witty about like how that could be a fancy title, but we'll just roll with that. Um, but dude, super excited to have you on the show today. Um, so your specialty is in laundromats and you have a whole like brand and podcast and everything else you've built around that. But I guess for people who haven't heard of you before or haven't necessarily heard your story or, or know anything about specifically what you do, give us a little bit of context about what your business currently looks like. I mean, are there a lot of people listening to this that live under a rock who don't know who I am? <laughs> I'm just Probably. Dude, half uh, the people listening don't even know who we are. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> uh, well, I can tell you, Mike is a subpar Frisbee golf player compared to me. Definitely. Yeah. And, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, disc golf, man, is that was fun when we did that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah that was fun when you came up here. more fun now. for you than me. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Came, came up to Spokane and we went and played some, some disc golf with a few other guys. It's a, it's a good activity to be. just like, yeah, Dan's terrible. Um, <laughs> it's a good activity to just go out and like kill like two hours with like a mixed audience of people when you don't really know what people like or are good at because it's low consequence. It's low effort. And like you get a little bit of exercise. You get to be outside. It's a good time. Yeah. Yeah. He's saying that, but. He was uh, ridiculing me the entire time for hitting pretty much every tree oh. on the course. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mike's Mike's having a lot of fun at your expense. Yeah, yeah. That's, no, I know. That's yeah. the only way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, back to who I am for the uh, living under the rock people. Uh, no, I'm uh, Jordan Barry, and uh, I am in the laundromat space. I you, it's actually funny that you are. We're um, we're doing this right now. I'm at a funny place in my kind of laundromat journey. Personally, um, I currently only own one laundromat at the moment. Uh, have had three uh, in the past, but I'm down to one. I've been selling for a couple of reasons. I'm sure we can talk about that. <clears throat> uh, but one of the big reasons is I'm also currently looking for portfolios of laundromats. So I'm I'm mm -hmm. actually divesting from my my original smaller laundromats and trying to go out and buy some portfolios. So. That's where I'm at in the journey right now. And then also I run Laundromat Resource, which is a community education platform, uh, resources, tools, hub for anybody interested in laundromats. Yeah. I mean, you said you owned three as far as I'm concerned. That's all the laundromats that still exist. Like I did. <laughs> <It's a huge laughs> in, the north, in the Northwest, we don't see a ton yeah. of them. It, it's honestly funny. Like since I've met you, Jordan, like now in Spokane, I see them everywhere. Like there all are the time, quite yeah. a few, right? You're like, oh, it's like the red car thing, right? Now I see at least on my normal like path, I see three laundromats. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, I've got, it's, I've got it, a good buddy, Kent Wales, who's up in Spokane uh, doing – pickup and delivery and he actually shut down his laundromat because he's doing pickup and delivery only now because he's just doing so much business so you guys should never do laundry wow. again just outsource it to kent dude if i Seriously. wasn't married i would absolutely do that but what does that I, mean I, 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 it gives her purpose she likes <laughs> oh, like geez. like her thing is that she does like the cleaning i do the the cooking and I, if i like outsourced all that podcasting. i would probably yeah, i'm sure I, she I, would I, find I a new purpose <laughs> I, I don't know dude yeah. i feel like i would get in trouble um but uh so how did you get into this laundromat game though? Because don't you live in like Newport Beach? I'm assuming it's not a common sort of thing down there. It's not like you live in like a big city where there's laundromats everywhere and you like grew up going to a laundromat. At least I'm assuming that you didn't, but I don't know. No, I, yeah, I'm in Orange County. I did not grow up going to a laundromat. Uh, I, laundromats never crossed my mind at any point in time uh, until they did actually. Uh, so yeah, so I actually was a, I was a pastor and a youth pastor for like 15 years and, uh, got to a point where I was ready. I had young kids and, and my wife and, uh, just got to a point where I was ready to do something else vocationally. And so I was trying to figure out what to do. And I had like this little bit of identity crisis. Uh, cause I was like, man, I've been doing pastoral ministry for almost 15 years. Like, what do I, what do you transition to from that? <laughs> like, yeah. there's no like hard skill sets that you develop at, as a pastor, really. Uh, no offense to any other pastors out there. Uh, you get a lot of great people skills, like a lot of relationship true. skills, yeah. honestly. Totally. But, Soft yeah. skills, you know yes. Help people. Hard skills. Yeah. It, yeah. It, you know, marketable skills. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, but did <laughs> I, I genuinely did have a little bit of a identity crisis trying to figure out what to do. Um, and we had a little bit of money in the bank. I had this great idea and I was like, why don't we rent out our house here in Southern California, take the 
chunk of change we have in the bank and go and buy a condo on the beach in Hawaii and go live there. This is before our kids were school aged. And I was like, we go do whatever. And we can sell jewelry on the beach for all I care in Hawaii. Uh, and, uh, my wife said we could do that or we could buy a laundromat. And so we ended up buying a laundromat and, uh, to this day, wait, I do wait, not wait, your own... wife gave up a condo on the beach in Hawaii and, and I... talked you into buying a laundromat. Yeah. yeah. Is, is your is your wife a dude in GoBundance? I like it's your just, wife. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. She is yeah. No, it's super and it this is funny, right? But it's like way more funny if you know my wife. It's like very out of character for her. Uh, but the way that she kind of came about this, and this was not on my radar, I knew nothing about business ownership. I knew nothing about investing, which is going to become very important here in a second. Uh, but the way that it came about was um, a friend of her family's was working a tech job up in the San Francisco Bay Area and making big money, but working big hours. And he ended up buying a laundromat, replaced that tech income with one laundromat wow. and was working you know, five to 10 hours a week, not 70 to 80 hours a week. And That's so, you know, low time commitment, low work and big cash flow. I was like, yeah, okay. I guess I'll give up the Hawaii dream for now because we're about to be yeah. mega rich in no time flat. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we can buy as many houses in Hawaii as we want to. So buy that's a whole what we did. island there. They got exactly, exactly how it is. Yeah. I, yeah, I've had my eye on Kauai for a while. So <laughs> <we'll> see. <laughs> All I'm thinking about is like that commercial that's like, who are you talking to? It's Jake from State Farm. It's like, Jake sounds like a dude. It's like, well, because he is. Yeah, <laughs> your right. wife, yeah. But your wife is not a dude in Go Bundance. She's just uh, smart. Um, I want to ask you the question about this because we kind of brought it up, I think, earlier before the pre show is like cash flow. So it sounds like this person that you guys knew um, bought a business that cash flowed really well and had a low time commitment. When you talk about that cash flow, and, and maybe this person was super unique, but like, what are you expecting out of an investment from like a cash on cash return? Because that's what else all us real estate guys think of. Yeah. I almost like, I almost hesitate to tell you because. Okay. I, how big is this uh, pocket? I just don't want everybody flooding into the laundromat space. But. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you can talk about idea. whatever. No one's going to do it anyway. We yeah. give okay, actionable yeah. advice <laughs> every single week, and people yeah. still ask us the same questions that we've been talking about okay. for two years. So your podcast, like my podcast, you got the same yeah. listeners probably. <laughs> exactly, uh, <laughs> they're the same people. <laughs> like honestly, though. Uh, listen, the one thing I've learned as a podcaster over here is that you don't insult the people listening to your podcast, which is what we're doing <laughs> right now. So that's uh, that's what Mike does. I'm sure they're good looking though. So they've got that yeah. going for them. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> to answer your question. So the, so the average kind of base hit laundromat, and let me, let me preface this by saying like, I'm a real estate investor. I have commercial and residential real estate, not a ton, but I have uh, both. Um, and I love real estate investing and it's probably my sort of first love. So uh, with that said, the average real estate deal can't touch the average laundromat deal when it comes to cash flow. Uh, at mm -hmm. least. And your average sort of base hit laundromat is looking at a 20 to 25% return cash on cash return. Uh, that's unleveraged. So once you throw a loan on that, um, that number just kind of goes up from there. Um, and again, it's not, I, I want to also just say up front, like this is not a passive, it's, it's sort of billed as a passive income. It's not a passive income. Um, but you can set it up. I, I see passivity as like a scale, uh, you know, and you can right. set it up to where it's pretty heavily weighted uh, on the passive side, but it's not totally passive. It is a business and you need to treat it like that. But uh, mm -hmm. pretty good return on your investment for, uh, you know, the time commitment there. And it's tough to beat that with any other business, really. Yeah, yeah. that seems yeah. like super good. And I, I like what you're saying about passive because what I hear um, – a lot of people talk about when it's like small business ownership is like, can you be an absentee owner? Meaning can you be the owner and not have to be there? You could be in your condo in Hawaii while it still prints money. And usually in a lot of these small businesses, if that's what you want, you can set it up that way. Granted, you'll have a small, you'll have less return because you need people and staff. Mm -hmm. But I would, and I would assume a laundry manager, you put managers in place and those sorts of things. It becomes more passive for you as the owner. Yep. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. Exactly true. Um, and so, you know, and, and you can get that right away. Uh, you're just going to, you're going to pay for it, right? You've got to buy a higher mm -hmm. performing laundromat and you're going to get a little bit less return because you're going to have to have that just a higher 
tier, that next tier up of employee that's going to command a higher salary or wage. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Like what sort of things do you even look for when you're looking at laundromats, right? Like, and where do you even find them if you're going to buy? Do you, de- do you end up approaching people directly? Are you just looking on like biz buy sell? Are you looking yeah. at, I don't know, like a conventional whatever else, like brokers or, or I guess, I, I don't know, like doing marketing? Yeah. So, so I do, a, I do a ton of consulting, uh, and coaching in this space. And so, and all over kind of the country and actually other countries as well, but you know, predominantly the U S and so I actually have this benefit of being able to see the market kind of all over. And what I see, so right now there's, you know, thank you, Cody Sanchez and Brandon Schlichter from investment joy, but there's more interest in laundromats than ever before. Uh, and there's less inventory than there is uh, demand for laundromats right now. So it can be tough to find them actually right now. So you can't find them on like biz buy sell stuff like that. But what I'm seeing a lot of success with with my consulting clients is three kind of main avenues that people are finding these uh, these deals predominantly. So one is going to those, you know, biz buy sell, biz bin, biz quest, biz. They're all biz something, right? Like biz. Yeah happy place or whatever. Uh, and you know, checking out the deals there. Yes. And sometimes you can find deals or make deals out of those, but, um, the sort of secret sauce of that is, is actually reaching out to the brokers. So usually if you're in a bigger city, there's laundromat specific brokers, um, and, or, uh, small business brokers and actually reaching out to them and letting them know, uh, you know, what you're looking for, where, what your criteria, price point, that kind of thing is, and really trying to build relationships with as many brokers in your market as possible, because still by and large, the majority of businesses in general, real estate in general, but laundromats specifically are sold through brokers. So they tend to be the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those sell before they end up on those biz, whatever sites. So you want to be on the inside with as many brokers as possible to find those deals. So that's one, two and three are similar to real estate. So that'd be like direct mail marketing. Um, and door knocking or just showing up at the laundromat trying to find uh, the owner and have a conversation with them. I'll second that broker relationship. Um, I've talked to just recently, the last six months, probably made contact with a couple brokers here, just random, random like acquaintances, basically just through the the grapevine of like, Oh, and I end up like, yeah, I'd love to talk to an actual business broker because there are people, what they tend to do is they'll go, value a property for somebody they'll do a run and run an analysis like we think your property is worth this much and it's usually a little bit high because they want those mm-hmm. people to sell the pro- their business with them which is fine right. and they all know that and they all tell each other they always say like the other one always tells you that the other guy's always high on his valuation high, right? yeah. <laughs> um, but you would be so stinking surprised about the amount of businesses for sale in your market that aren't on biz buy sell because like the one guy I talked to recently, he's like, yeah, honestly, I stopped using biz by sell because I just kept getting spammed. And so he's like, I just now just listed directly and obviously doesn't have any problems selling businesses, but you know, maintaining those relationships and continuously, you can't just call these people once, but if you can maintain that relationship over a long period of time that you'll find probably if you're very specific on your laundromat search, you'll probably find one or whatever business that is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when, you're, totally when you're looking at these, deals <clears throat> is it normally just a business or are you ever buying it like with the building because i i mean i guess ones i've always seen are always in like strip malls and different stuff yeah uh yeah both uh so you know there there's people out there that own laundromats that are like i will never buy a laundromat unless i also can buy the real estate um mm-hmm. which is great uh some markets that's just not feasible and sometimes it just doesn't make sense to do that but i always say anytime it does make sense and you have that opportunity you know, buy, buy that real estate. Cause number one, a lot of times you can get better financing terms. If you're buying the real yeah. estate, banks are way more happy to lend on, you know, a real, uh, uh, you know, piece of real estate than they are on a cash business where the taxes don't match up with the bank statements and the P and L's and nothing, you know, nothing matches. Um, so that is helpful, but also, uh, you know, you can, you know, build a lot of equity and gain a lot of tax advantages from having the real estate along with the business. Um, but sure. I always say my, you know, my kind of my opinion on it and my perspective on it is laundromats are a cash flow business. They do have really good tax advantages also, a lot of equipment to depreciate and stuff like that. Um, and you can build equity in them, although the equity builds slower in laundromats than it does in real estate. Uh, but they're pre- predominantly a cash flow 
business, right? So for me, it it's not a big deal if I'm leasing the space, if I don't own the real estate, as long as the cash flow numbers make sense. Sure. Yeah. So like when you're going into these, what are the main things I guess that you're looking for? Is there like a certain size that's a sweet spot? I'm assuming you don't want to buy one that has like four stackable washers and dryers. I feel like that'd be a giant waste of time. But also, I mean, if there's one that has like a hundred, does that even exist? Like, like I have no context for what's a little or what's a lot or anything with this stuff. You know, it's funny. I just interviewed a guy on my podcast. His episode hasn't even come out while we're talking at least, uh, who's in Brazil and there's this huge influx of tiny laundromats that have like three washers, three dryers. Like a hotel. They put them in like, uh, like in shopping centers, like shopping malls hmm. or grocery stores and stuff like that. Where people can go throw their stuff in and, uh, go do their shopping and stuff. So it's kind of interesting. So that there is are, there is a business plan where that works. Uh, and, but you know, in the U S that's not super common. Um, so, you know, the, the average sort of size of a laundromat is probably somewhere between 2,500 and 3,500 square feet. Uh, Mm -hmm. but there's laundromats. There's one down the street for me. I was just at an awesome laundromat, but it's 11,000 square feet. It's gigantic. It's got over a hundred machines in it. Um, so, but probably average is 2,500 to 3,500, uh, square feet. Um, but also the size only matters so much. I've got a buddy who was on the podcast a long time ago. He's got a 600 square foot laundromat and he does, you know, over six figures worth of, uh, net income out of that 600 square foot laundromat, but he's doing more active. He's got, he's on the service side, pickup and delivery, uh, laundry also. And it's really not about, um, the size of your laundromat. It's what you do with it. So. (laughs) There you go. You're just waiting for that one, Dan. <laughs> I've been I've so been telling my wife that for a long time. She's, <laughs> I don't know. But she, but she just keeps saying, I, "I want the bigger one, though. I want yeah, the bigger the one that one, has yeah. an accent." Yeah. Oh wait, that's right. Uh, that something different. So this <laughs> actually, the way you say this, um, not about the size thing, but the comments about the strip center because you're talking I don't even about know what we're talking micro. about anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's rattled. The, I, but I just have this, Mike knows, I have this fascination. It's probably because of where we live, where I'm like, I need to buy like an like an e-cigarette vape store. And mm-hmm. like, but now that, yeah, like, they're always in like strip malls next to like the, yeah. the fingernail place. And it's starting to make sense now though. Like you could put a laundromat in a strip mall because there's other things they can do. So they do their shopping right next door to maybe you do mm-hmm. get a vape store to move in next door because then they can go get their vapes or whatever. And I'm just totally stereotyping here and I shouldn't do that, but I just feel like that's a common thing where we're at like laundromats and vapes seem to be super common and, and weed mm-hmm. stores. Cause we're in Washington. Mm-hmm. So you can stack some of those in there plus like a grocery store. And so then the pr- people are more likely to come to your location, increase your profits. Yeah. And the good thing about the vape store uh, or the, or the weed store is that similar to laundromats, it's a very habitual thing, mm-hmm. right? Like you, you got to come every, laundry every week, every week and yeah. you got to go kind of refill that stuff. So yeah, if you can associate them together. No, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I think there is a lot to say with, uh, you know, these, these businesses that there's synergies, uh, with them and they cater to similar demographics, same with like a dollar tree or dollar general, whatever the dollar stores are now. Sure. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. fast food restaurants, a lot of that serves similar demographics. That's kind of a shortcut to finding out if this is a good spot to put a laundromat or not, or at least a self-serve laundromat. It's also a good idea too, right? Because if you have like the weed store and the vape store and you have the fast food joint, they all both make your Clothes freaking stinks. So you're gonna have to keep That's coming right. back to do more laundry. <laughs> right, going doing laundry. Gosh, and you're gonna yeah. get the munchies. You got the grocery store there. It's all yeah, right. It all ties together. This is full circle. Yeah, we'll put it, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting. So I get when people are looking at these places, I imagine traditional financing what was like SBA loans or seller financing. <laughs> um, like I guess let let's say you're in a scenario where you're able to get a killer financing terms. You're going to have a seller that's going to carry 100%. You have to come any money out of pocket. You're still going to need money to operate this thing, reserves. What should people expect to even have liquid available? Like how much are these machines? Because I imagine they're more expensive than just like the ones that you get at Lowe's for a rental property. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So your machines are probably ranging from two to $25,000 a piece, depending on- 25000 wow. a piece? Yeah, so they've got machines that- 
do like 125 pounds of laundry. They're massive Jesus. machines, yeah. and they're going to be in that twenty to twenty five thousand dollar range. But you're charging eighteen, twenty, sometimes more than that per wash dollars per wash uh, out of that machine, and it's getting mm-hmm. people in and out quickly because they're just throwing everything all in one big washer. <laughs> yeah, they're doing all of it in one washing machine in an hour. They're in, they're out. Everything's dry. Maybe it takes longer no to fold, but no one's doing 125 pounds of laundry. Are they doing like an entire like little league team? You'd be surprised. Bodies. Man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You not you don't have kids yet. That's why kids are yeah. filthy, <laughs> disgusting creatures. This is and true. They just <clears throat> make a mess of everything. That's yep. that's what yeah. it is. Yep. So, but that, but that that that's a ton though. So and, and like with that, can you? Are there ways to get like financing for the machines, or do like do you need like besides like a credit card? Or like a business line of credit, like if you went and you have this as a, you know, I I don't again I don't I don't know what the options even are for that. Like do do yeah. those large like laundry machine companies will they like finance that to you so yep. that you can actually use additional leverage? Yeah, and a lot of times you can do so. The manufacturers will offer financing. A lot of times you can do one hundred percent financing on the machines wow, okay. too. Um, so there's acquisition financing, and then there's retool financing. Yeah. You just let the business, I mean, the, obviously the business has to be able to support that or you've got to have a game plan on how you can make it support that. If it's not there yet, that could be part of your plan to increase business and increase revenues. Um, so you want to be smart about that obviously, but yeah, hundred percent financing terms are available, uh, for equipment purchases. Um, which so is the better again, play then because, because <clears throat> like you're saying, like the, to me, it seems like a capital, intensive business to start because but now that you're saying you can get financing potential from the manufacturers you get a three thousand square foot <clears throat> building and you want to retrofit it <clears throat> is it a better play to do that or just find one that's for sale and buy it uh, because you know I, yeah. I don't know which one would be better it seems like it costs more if it already has cash flow uh yes and no so so the downside, you can actually retrofit, sure. obviously, white box, you know, and turn it into a laundromat. Um, the down, the downsides to that is that, you know, laundromats require a lot of infrastructure. So you got a lot of plumbing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got to have larger water lines. You've got to have larger uh, sewer lines. You've got to have um, more electrical capacity. Uh, mm-hmm. So typically you're having to increase, you know, or uh, install a larger water meter and start install another you know one or two electrical panels and then you're running all that stuff so there's a lot of build out costs uh that that go along with that um and then one thing that can be cost prohibitive depending on the area so this varies wildly depending on the area so if you're thinking about building one out in a white white box uh this is definitely something to look at before you get too far down that road is something called impact fees and uh impact fees are you know there's a lot of ridiculous government fees out there uh impact yeah. fees have got to be towards the top of the most ridiculous it's basically like a thumbs up like an aok we al- we're going to allow you to connect to the sewer lines it's not a permit to do that it's not a the actual connecting it up it's just a it's okie dokie uh fee so it's stu- it's super ridiculous some places don't have them at all uh, but I was looking to build out a 3,000 square foot uh, white box space here. Awesome location in, here in Southern California with a couple of partners. And we got down the line and we finally uh, discovered that those impact fees um, were charged per machine. And in oh. that 3,000 square foot space, it was going to be $390,000 just for <laughs> the yeah. impact fee alone. That's crazy. Um, that makes sense. So, you know, in that case, that, I mean, that killed that deal because that's not any of the permits. That's not any of the build outs. That's not any of the machines. Mm. Uh, so that took our $1.2 million build out to a $1.6 million build out and it just didn't just make sense it. anymore. Yeah. 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 Huh. yeah. <clears throat> what are some of like the, I guess on top of those fees, like the biggest sort of operational things that people probably don't think about when it comes to like these laundromats. Yeah. So, I mean, when you first acquire, you actually, you know, there's a lot of, uh, if you, if you're anybody is out there who's searched, you know, how to buy a laundromat or something like that on, on YouTube specifically, uh, there's a lot of content out there about quote unquote free laundromats. 
um, which is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, the, the essentials on the free laundromat is you find one that's closed down and you negotiate a new lease and then you 100% finance equipment and you get the landlord to pay TI to do tenant improvements to fix it all up and, and all that, uh, which is technically possible. It's much, much more difficult to do now and it's the riskiest way to get in this business, but it's technically possible. But uh, what a lot of people do don't understand is that there's actually a lot of money that goes down in front. So you've got, you know, a lot of times you have utility down payment uh, deposits, you've got <laughs> rent deposits, uh, you've got a whole lot of these sort of upfront costs. And, uh, you know, especially if it's not up and running, when you take over, you've got carrying costs until you can get up to profitability. Uh, I've seen that mistake happen multiple times where people didn't factor in how long it was going to take to get to profitability. Uh, and so, you know, that can, that can kill your deal, uh, right, right out of the water. Um, if you're not sure. capitalized well enough. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And then operationally, what are like the things that you do besides being next to a fast food joint and vape store that like make it so that yours, your laundry mask, the one that they come to, I, I imagine proximity is a huge part of it to yeah. the target demographic, but like, let's say you have another one across the street. How do you make it so that yours is the best one? Well, I mean, you want to take care of the basics. This seems really obvious, but if you've ever gone into a laundromat, you've probably seen what we call a zombie mat, uh, which is, you know, it's dingy. It, half the machines are out. Half the lights are out. Maybe homeless people are sleeping in there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's just a lot of those around there. So take care of the basics, number one. Uh, keep the place clean. Keep it safe. You know, keep, make sure all your machines are up and running, make sure there's change in the change machines. If you're running with coins or your card readers are working, you know, just the basic stuff. Uh, number one, uh, number two is, you know, you want to, it, it's like, uh, it's like any other business, right? The customer experience and that feeling they get when they come to your business, it matters, right? It's going to determine, you know, really the, the people that are right here around your laundromat, most likely they're going to come to yours unless you're really like screwing things up. Right. Um, and really you're only kind of competing with, you know, with other laundromats for a relatively small number who are, could kind of go either way. Right. So you want to make sure they have a good experience. So that's, you know, uh, if you have like attendance there, it's making sure that they are trained to be, you know, friendly and greet people and help people and answer questions and, uh, you know, if there's a problem, you as the owner or your attendants take care of it quickly. It's, it's all that customer service, the, the unreasonable hospitality uh, sort of mentality is going to set you apart. And then, you know, obviously you can add other things in there, like having an ATM machine to make it more convenient in there, having vending that has detergents and stuff. So if they forget something, you've got it, uh, snacks and stuff like that. Um, so there's a lot of little things that you can do to kind of enhance that customer experience, but that's a huge, uh, a huge part of it for sure. Hmm. Nice. And then, uh, I guess if somebody wanted to get into this space, what are like the first sort of steps they should do aside from just like contacting brokers, like for them, like personally to be fully prepared yeah. for it. Um, I mean, that was just the educational piece. Is it like more about, is there like technical stuff they should be learning? Is it just like, if you understand business, you can kind of piece it out. Is there a lot of financial sort of preparation they should do? Yeah. I mean, I, there's, I have a, not to kind of promote this, but there's a, I have a free course. It's, it's free. It's three lessons. It tells you uh, how to find it, how to uh, analyze it so you can value it and then how to do due diligence. That due diligence piece is the most technical part of yeah. the process uh, because listen, this is a cash business, right? And one huge benefit of the cash business is that seller financing is actually fairly common in this industry, uh, mm -hmm. which is sort of like the mythical unicorn of real estate. Everybody's looking for seller financing yep. deals, right? It's pretty common in our industry. Um, but the downside to that sort of the flip side of seller financing being available is that, it's available because a lot of times the the income doesn't match up with what's on their taxes and what's on the bank yeah. statement. So you can't actually get finance, traditional financing for it a lot of times. Right. And it's hard to verify how much money is actually coming into this place and how much money is actually going out and how much is left over. 
uh, right? Mm -hmm. So that due diligence period uh, process is uh, probably the most technical part of it. So researching there, but also just kind of getting to know some other people in the community. You can do that through, you know, listening to the podcast or getting in a Facebook group or going on forums or something like that. Uh, But those two things, sort of the education and the getting to know some owners and getting the real scoop, I'd recommend. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so when you say like the finances tend to be kind of weird, is that because they're depreciating so much because of the equipment that's involved or because they're skimming money off the top because most of what they get is in coins and cash? Yeah. Uh, I like to say this. Laundromat owners are either (laughs) really, really bad at keeping the books. Yeah. I've literally gotten, I watched one time I was, uh, I was actually the broker in the deal and we were trying to get a, a PNL from from the seller, and I literally watched as they grabbed a napkin off the center console, put it on the hood of their car, and started writing out the PNL on the hmm, napkin nice. in front of me. Oh yeah, not so like from memory, exactly. you know. And so they're either really bad at keeping books, or they don't keep books, or they're really good at keeping books. Like maybe yeah, yeah. two books, they have more than one book. Even I don't know. You yeah. know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, so it's the real one and the fake one. Yeah, obviously there's a lot of depreciation, but you can see the depreciation, right? And banks can look at that depreciation and see, okay, that's depreciation. So we'll add that back in. But it's just, it's been sort of this long, and I actually don't recommend uh, skimming off the top. I think you actually lose more than you gain from skimming off the top. Uh, And I don't think you need to, because there's so many good tax advantages of owning a laundromat. Uh, but, uh, it's really common in this industry, especially from a lot of like the old school laundromat owners. Yeah. But the tax advantages are even better if you're making less money. Yeah. Right. (laughs) True. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) So Uh, I do um, have one more question on along that lines because, um, like you say self financing and, and everybody talks about SBA financing, which is really not like an incredibly good product. Um, you know, from an interest rate standpoint all the time, it's not always the best product and the challenge that you, I think, right, exactly. That's the major advantage, right? No, like low down payment and they will put a lien on your house for some of the equity, which could be a good or bad thing. Um, but like they are an asset intensive business. Is it when you're buying these? And and I say that because on an SBA loan, if it's goodwill value, meaning like you're basically just saying you make this much money, I want to pay you three times that. SBA sees that as like, I don't care. You still have no assets that we can take if you don't pay us. So they care about assets and they will loan against the assets and everything else. Like I said, you either have to come to the table with cash or you have to, they'll put a second position lean on your, on your mortgage for some of the, up to the, whatever the equity you have. So is it because these laundromats likely have depreciated a lot of those assets so that there's already no value there anyways, or is it more of a, the seller finance more just a product of that's just the the name of the game because of the cash flow situations? Yeah, it's more because of the, the name of the game because of the cash flow and, and people yeah. kind of books not matching up and skimming yeah, off okay. the top. That's a huge, yeah. uh, a huge part of it. Um, for sure. Uh, you can actually, I, I have actually a, a guy in Go Abundance, uh, Bo Eckstein. He actually mm-hmm. uh, does a lot of SBA loans with laundromat uh, guys. He just finished uh, getting one with uh, the, the person had no collateral uh, whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And so he, but he was able to get an SBA loan. Um, and oh, the way wow. they did it, I don't know, I don't know all the technicalities of it, but essentially the way they did it was they create. They essentially said, okay, this laundromat's here, but it's going to be a startup. We're essentially starting it over and SBA lend, lend, lended money on it based on it being a startup as opposed to an acquisition. Uh, oh, interesting. So, yeah. So there's some things that you can do um, with SBA, but a lot of the, the other side of it is even with, uh, even if an owner does have good books, which does happen, even if they do have good books, a lot of times they don't want to jump through all the hoops SBA throws at them uh, because it's a lot of work and a long a lot a lot of time too they sba loans usually take longer to to go through too so Mm -hmm. yeah they do awesome right on well just as we wrap up here um i wanted to go into really quickly your uh roll-up strategy you're planning to do with buying these portfolios because i know we talked about that when you were out here i think it's really interesting um yeah so you mind touching that really quick yeah yeah so you know I was doing a uh, I was doing a podcast interview with a guy one time, and I've been saying for a long time. Look, I think 
you know, we saw this happen with storage. We saw this happen with car washes. I think it's coming for laundromats. We finally are starting to get our act together over here and adopting technology that allows you to ditch the quarters that allows you to manage multiple locations. And I think that there's going to be more and more, and we're already seeing it uh, more and more sophisticated business owners and investors coming into this industry and running it like a legit business, uh, not like a mom and pop. And uh, this guy on my podcast was saying, yeah, there's a hundred million dollar laundromat business coming uh, within the next five to 10 years. And after that, I started thinking about, I was like, there is a hundred million dollar laundromat business coming down the pipeline. Cause it's doable now. Um, and then I was like, well, why am I not doing it? If, if it's going to happen, I should just do it. So that is uh, a, yeah. that's a direction I'm, I'm moving towards right now. We're uh, going to partner with investors and go out and try to buy, you know, a few hundred laundromats uh, and roll them up and either sell them uh, as a portfolio to, you know, private equity or hedge fund or something, or take it public um, those are, uh, sort of some of the, uh, the exit strategies we're looking at. And what's interesting about it is that because they're cash flowing businesses with great tax advantages, there's a lot, um, we can get a lot for even paying like a regular sort of base hit average deal. Um, and then with sort of our operational knowledge, we think we can increase, uh, obviously cash flow an equity there. Um, but also we think that there's an equity premium to be had just by putting them all in a portfolio. So I think there's a lot of upside from a lot of different angles and we're already seeing a lot of interest from, uh, investors and being a part of that. The trick now is just finding those deals to buy. It's one thing to say, you want to go get a few hundred laundromats, but this is a very fragmented, uh, industry. And so having to do a lot of onesie twosies, uh, and it's just hard to, hard to get them yeah. quickly that way. Yeah. 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 Could you so do I'm, like a massive I'm Google search for laundry mats and then like have a VA scrape off, skip trace all those people I have all or scrape them, yeah. their numbers off of you do. Okay. Have, so you've done yeah, it. I have now every you just gotta get a laundromat them. that's online at least. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fascinating. I've got a list Good for you. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And you, well, you need to find the ones that aren't online. You got to get out there and start moving yeah. the pavement. What you what you should do? Have you ever seen on? Uh, they'll have like those competitions. They're like like basically Google Maps competitions where they'll be like, you yeah. got to find like this place in Russia. You should yeah. hire some of those guys to find new laundromats <laughs> all around the United States. I know that's true. Dude, some idea, of those guys are man. insane. They're they insane. Are. Yeah, they know like Dude. everything. That, yeah, it's like yeah. a picture. They see it for three seconds. And they're like, oh yeah, this is in middle of nowhere, Brazil, and you're like, what? How Such that? a like cool but also wasted skill. Yeah, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah. It's cool. You should hit up it, those guys yeah. on on Twitch or their OnlyFans or whatever they do, and yeah. uh, see if they'll <laughs> um, help you out find some laundry. So, yeah, um, I'm cool. too busy well, making very, my very own cool. OnlyFans. Yeah, I don't have time to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Only laundry. <laughs> Only laundry. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Well, good stuff, Jordan. Very interesting what you've been putting together. Um, so we have our typical end of show questions that we normally ask. We'll change them a little bit for you because you're not strictly a real estate guy. Um, All right, let's do it. But the uh, the number one question that we have is normally what is your craziest real estate investing story? But in yours, you have laundromats. I'm sure you've had some weird laundromat stories. So what is your craziest laundromat story that you've had? Oh my gosh, there's so many. Well, so we didn't really even get into my first laundromat, but I bought that one. It did not work out like the friend of the families who scored, Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up losing a ton of money for a lot of years trying to figure out, you know, what in the world is happening. There's a stat that floats around that says, you know, laundromats are 95% success rate. And I was like, how in the world am I in the 5% that can't figure out this easy (laughs) business? Right. But one of the problems was I bought a zombie mat, which, uh, ended up being, uh, gang turf gang territory. Um, Mm. And so I ended up literally having to fight for my laundromat. So I did, um, lucky for me, uh, I had never used it before, but I had taken Krav Maga for 15 years, which is like Israeli hand-to-hand close quarters combat. (laughs) Never used it before in my life. And I put three people in the hospital. uh, You Krav Maga them? (laughs) Yeah, Krav Maga them. (laughs) That first like six months of owning that first laundromat. And I'm literally like... 
dude, I've got two young kids. I should be on a freaking beach in Hawaii and I'm over here fighting. Uh, <laughs> this is like and losing money at the same time. Like, oh, this is not what I signed up for. Like, this is miserable. <laughs> so what is the scenario that's even happened? Is this like you just went and decided to open up a can of whoop ass on these guys? Or were they like, you, Saturday, 9 p.m., you're fighting yeah, for your corner. The wrong colors, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you my favorite one because uh, it is kind of funny. So I walked in one day and this guy was just out cold sitting on the bench. He was just like slumped over, you know, chin to chest, out cold. He had all his like stuff. It might have been everything he owned was all laying out on one of the folding tables. There was like drug paraphernalia and stuff. So I'm like, dude, what the heck? So I go to like wake him up. I'm like shaking the guy. I'm like, Hey, 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 I'm like shaking him like non-responsive whatsoever, not responding at all. And I was like, dude, is this guy? And I didn't want to get too close. Cause I didn't want him to like come to, and I don't know, dude, there's, I had, there's a ton of crazy stories. Um, so, but you know, I, so I called an ambulance and I was like, Hey, I don't know if this guy is dead or what, but he's, you know, he's here in my, my laundromat. He's non-responsive. So the ambulance came and right before they got there, he actually came to, he woke up and I was like, you okay, dude, are you all right? And he's like, yeah, hey, well, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm like, all right. Well, I was like, just to let you know, like I was trying to wake you up. You weren't responding. So I called the ambulance. They're coming. Um, and so he, uh, the ambulance came and he was like very combative with them. <clears throat> and he would, they were like, are you okay? What's going on? can you answer that? They, they said, you need to answer three questions so we can determine if you're like with it, if you're, if you're good or not. And he was like, not answering. So this one real big EMT got in the guy's face was like, look, I'm going to throw you in, in the, uh, in the ambulance. I'm going to strap you to the bed and throw you in the ambulance. If you don't answer these three questions, what's your name? What's the date? Yada, 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 whatever they were. So finally the guy, he was intimidated because this guy was huge. Um, and he answered the questions. And so the ambulance left, and then I, meanwhile, I'm in the back and I'm like just doing whatever I'm doing. I'm, I don't know, cleaning or stocking the vending machines or whatever. And he is like yelling, uh, like just obscenities. And he's like, I'm going to F you up, blah, blah, blah. And he had an earbud in. So I thought he was on the phone. And eventually I was like, are you talking to me? Like, have you been talking to me this whole time? I thought you were on the phone. He's like, yeah, I'm talking to you. Effing narked on me. And I was like, I didn't narc on you. Like I, I called, I thought you were dying, man. I thought you were dead. I called the ambulance and he, I was like, he's starting to get, you know, combative. Uh, and in my face, I'm like, look, I don't, I, you know, I don't have any pride with these guys. Like, dude, you live on the street. I, you've got nothing to lose. I like call me whatever you want. Call my mom, whatever you want. I don't even care. Your opinion means nothing to me. So I'm like, look, dude, I'm going to go. So I was going to leave and then just call the police to have him come escort him out. Uh, but he stepped between me and the door and he wouldn't let me pass. And he shoved me and I was like, listen, I don't have any problems with you. I'm just going to go. And so I tried to go around him again and he threw a swing at me and he missed. Uh, but as soon as he threw a swing at me, I'm like, look, I'm not going to get caught by a sucker punch or a lucky punch or whatever, hit my head on the folding table and go out cold. Cause then who knows what's going to happen to me. And so as soon as he threw that, that punch at me, I, reared back and I hit him hard three times in the face. And he was, as he was falling backwards, I sort of like cradled him down to the ground. And while I was cradling him, I actually hit him with three hard elbows on the way down. And he was out <laughs> cold. You're like, I'm helping you so you don't fall and hit so, hard. Yeah. So <laughs> then I called the ambulance again. Cause he's, you know, he's, he's out, he's, he's down. And the now same ambulance comes back <laughs> and they put him on the stretcher and they haul him out. And then the big dude who was there before, he came back in and he's like, dude, I wanted to do that so bad. I'm glad you got a chance to do it and fist bump me and left. That's crazy, dude. It was wild. Yeah, that's crazy. Krav Maga. He got Krav Maga. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Krav Maga. Got, that's yeah. No Krav Massage yeah. happening over here. <laughs> Only Krav Maga. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Next question. What is the number one tip you can give to a small business owner looking to take their business to the next level? Dude, I, genuinely, the best thing that you can do is find somebody who knows what they're doing in your space and and cozy up to them. If you got to pay them, pay them. Uh, if you're lucky enough to know somebody, uh, just ride those coattails. What's the standing on the shoulders of giants? Uh, I learned a lot of hard and expensive lessons that I didn't have to learn by myself 
could have got those from someone else. Um, I, I like to say if me, when I first bought my first laundromat could have had a 15 minute conversation with me now, it would have saved me over six figures, uh, easy. So find somebody in your space and, uh, and learn from them, whether you got to pay them or, or whatever, do what you got to do. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's huge. Go. That was huge for us. And I think that people get this weird aversion to doing that, but yeah, paying for help. Yeah. Or they, they feel like, I don't know, there's a lot of people that feel like they it should come for free just because yeah. they're like, Oh, well, you're yeah. already successful. Or like, or if you're really that good, like you wouldn't be getting money for it. I'm like, no, it's because my time's actually worth something. And yep. I don't know if you're worth my time yet. <laughs> yep. That's exactly um, right. So cool. Last question. Where can people find you, follow you and reach out to you? Yeah. So laundromatresource.com uh, is the platform. It's laundromat resource. A lot of people put a Y in there, but it's no. Uh, laundromatresource.com. I mean, you can just Google anything laundromat related on laundromat resource will probably pop up. Laundromat resource podcast. If you're a podcast listener and interested in that, I interview uh, long form interviews of laundromat owners and other industry professionals. Uh, super popular, weirdly popular podcast for a laundromat podcast. Um, yeah. And then my email is Jordan, J O R D A N, at laundromatresource.com. Cool. Nice. Easy enough. Well, right on, guys. Well, you guys should definitely go and give Jordan a follow. Check out his podcast. And if you have any interest in launch mats at all, shoot him a DM. You know, if you did, if you, in case you guys missed it, he's trying to do a big roll up right now of all these different launcher mats. So if you have any near you that you might be wanting to purchase, you're trying to figure out, I would have a bet he might be interested in partnering with you on it and making you a part of that endeavor. So don't be afraid to right. reach out to him. I know there's a bunch of you guys out there that are kind of like suckers for deals and you're always looking for your next opportunity. And if you have this happens to be a laundromat, hit up Jordan because he will definitely be able to help you out with it. So Jordan, man, thanks so much for coming on the show. We really, really appreciate the time. And everybody, thanks so much for listening. And we'll talk to you guys next week.